everybody. This is Josh KI6NAZ, and I'm joined with Josh Tanner, the director of Decommissioned, and Frank Bauer, KA3HDO, the Eris chairman. And today we're going to be talking about Decommissioned, a really interesting video that is now out on Vimeo. The link will be in the description for this video, and uh, you can check it out. It's a, it's a very interesting concept, and it was just a, an opportunity that came up to bring Josh and Frank together to kind of talk about not just the video, but kind of the origin of SuitSat 1. So first question for, um, for Josh, what gave you the idea to do Decommissioned? How, how, did, it, how did it come about? I am a little bit of a tragic for falling down um, Wikipedia black holes. Um, I absolutely love just searching, you know, odd bits of history and information and, and my, um, well, I'm a filmmaker, obviously, and um, my wife, Jade, who is also a co-writer of this short film, we both discovered the, um, we're both really obsessed with space, um, and we discovered uh, Suitsat um, on Wikipedia, and it was an initial... Um, sort of two-pronged reaction. One, it was, this is genius. It's amazing that they did this. How have I never heard of this before? Um, and the second one was, it's kind of creepy <laughs> that, <laughs> that they, they put a, <laughs> that they sort of had what looks like a stranded dead astronaut yeah. floating around the earth to, to keep floating around the earth until it burnt up. And then add on to that, that there were voices of children being transmitted from it. It was just these compounded levels of, oh my gosh, that is the creepiest thing ever. <laughs> of course, always keeping in mind, yes, it's amazing um, that they sort of turned this, you know, decommissioned piece of, um, you know, the, the space suit into something really worthwhile. <laughs> in, but, indeed. Um, yeah, that was really... Yeah, that was really the, the genesis was like discovering that the, that suits that existed. And then, you know, all of the sort of films, or not all of the films, but a lot of the films that we make tend to take sort of pieces of history that are either quite odd or really interesting that maybe a lot of people don't know about and then sort of spinning off a sort of a fictional story around that. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, that's kind of in a nutshell how it came about. That's that's very interesting, and and I guess I I never really thought of it like that. But yeah, at the end of the day, this is a suit that was kind of just thr thrust out into the vacuum of space, if you will. Let, let's get a little bit background on what suits that is. Frank, can you kind of give a bit of history on on its origins and and a little bit about its its time in activation? I guess you could say. Yeah, I sure can. So so. Um... You know, a little bit of background about Eris. You know, we've been involved now. We've been operating for 20 years now at this point on Space Station. And uh, um, 24 years ago, we started working this international relationship of trying to get all of the, the uh, image radio groups around the world to work together to, to build and fly and operate, you know, the radio systems on Space Station. And of course, um, you know, NASA and uh, the major aerospace company, or, um, I'm sorry, space agencies are, are clearly um, working this thing. And, and in Russia, of course, uh, the Roscosmos is, is working that. So our interface is with Sergei Sambarov um, and RV, uh, RV3DR. And, and he uh, came to me one day and said, hey, Frank, what do you think of this idea? Um, we have... What NASA does with their spacesuits is that um, after a period of time, they will recycle parts and uh, fix them and put them back together. The Russians throw them out. Mm. Uh, big difference between what the United States does with their spacesuits and the Russians do. So he said, we've got this suit we're going to be throwing out in, uh, in a, within a year. Mm -hmm. And if we do this fast enough, we could actually put ham radio gear in it and fly it. And then... You know, that's when all of the ideas came out. I mean, he, he was the initial brainchild of this thing. And then, you know, we just started running with it from a perspective of uh, how do we bring students involved in it? How do we uh, how do we do this thing? And the time scale was very tight. Mm -hmm. And if we didn't meet the time scale, 
they were going to throw the suit out. So in, in a nutshell, that's what it was. We had three weeks. By the time both NASA and Roscosmos agreed to do this thing, uh, or let us do this thing, because there's a lot of safety things that go along with it. We had three yeah. weeks to pull it all together and, and get it ready for launch. That's pretty impressive. Uh, how long was it in Amazing. service, if you will? If you, <laughs> Yeah. So it was battery operated. I mean, if you remember the Sputniks as well as the first Oscar satellite, the image radio, first image radio satellite, it was, those were battery operated. This was battery operated. Mm -hmm. We didn't have any solar panels or anything else. So we were expecting maybe about 10 days worth of operation. We got about two weeks. Oh. Um, but then, you know, the other part of it was the spacesuit just flying out there in space. And when was it going to come back in? And uh, we had people tracking that. And um, we had what we called a, a chicken little contest. You know, the sky is the falling. The sky is when falling. Is, yeah, when is, when is this, uh, this suit set going to come in and reenter? And we actually had a little contest for students uh, in in you know elementary high school as well as adults to to uh, to guess that how long was it up before it so came down it, uh, uh, it was launched on the 3rd of february and i think um um it was august it was about six months a little over six oh, months okay i so. yeah i mean it had nothing in it to kind of help it keep going so it was just in a degrading orbit basically right. from the moment it started right so it was never intentionally placed in a in an orbit that would be up there for a while right no actually um you know there's a couple things that uh, we had to do um which was innovative it was pioneering actually mm -hmm. um and that was to take something of this mass and allow the crew to hand deploy it and make sure it didn't recontact the space station sure Maybe they had to put it in a re you know basically a retrograde orbit right so that it wouldn't it wouldn't uh recontact yeah because again you could you could end up hitting it on another pass or or who knows what right right very interesting and then the other part about that was we had to have a three redundancies in making sure it didn't turn on with the crew around it so oh yeah good good point too. If, you, if you if you look at the top of the suit set uh, uh both josh's you can see three, basically, it were three, three switches turned it on, turned on a timer, and then enabled the, the transmitter after the timer was over. So uh, we did all of that. Uh, we got safety to approve that, safety to approve, uh, you know, how it was going to get deployed. And frankly, that opened up, you know, if you are aware, Space Station deploys satellites routinely now off of usually CubeSats. And we pioneered all that stuff for, for all these commercial companies to do that. Very cool. That's amazing. So, Josh, you know, it, it's it's a short video, but it's really nicely shot, and there's a lot of complex scenes in, in the video. You know, the a lot of the shots you took seemed relatively ambitious. The, there's the zero-G scenes, obviously, because they're on the ISS. How did you do yeah. that? How did you come up with that stuff? What, what, where did you learn what it is, these, these secrets that you have to make these shots? <laughs> uh, look, I mean, certainly not secrets, but um, I think the, the first thing to say is this sh the short film was written about three years ago, and... Um, if you can imagine anything to do with sort of making a movie and having complex visual effects, computer generated imagery, it's very expensive. Mm -hmm. um, and what has happened in the interim three years is there's been a great push towards using game engine development in feature films um, okay. or TV series as well. Um, which basically means that you get to use the 3D environments that are, you know, I'm used in video games now, but they've become so photorealistic uh, that you're able to sort of like merge them into film and video production. Um, so what happened was this company called Epic who uh, um, run a game engine called Unreal Engine. Um, they did a Star Wars show uh, called The Mandalorian and they used um, all video game uh, backgrounds um, to sort of on, literally live on set instead of a, having a blue screen or a green screen to sort of composite the imagery behind them you literally were getting that imagery on set 
so the actors could see you know their spatial relations to what what was really there and they were getting the interactive lighting so for example if you were shooting green screen you would have to simulate the lighting of whatever you were going to add into the picture next whereas if you had this live virtual production on set you were getting you know all of the interactive lighting the reflections all of those things on the day um, so this company epic uh, teamed up with the australian uh, film industry to offer um, a bunch of filmmakers um, a small cash um, amount to make short films using the unreal engine and it just so happened that we had the script for decommission which we thought would be impossible for the resources we had um, and we were like oh my gosh this is our opportunity to make this and we'd found out um, I think in October last year and we had probably about seven weeks from the thumbs up to delivering the you know the film um, to to make it, um, mm -hmm. which was a, a crazy turnaround. So it's interesting you're talking about the suit sat having sort of being spurred on by a you know rushed development. Um, that's sort of what we went through as well. <laughs> what was the biggest challenge in making decommissioned? I think it was the zero gravity. I think yeah. it, because a lot of um, gosh, like even feature films you know they they kind of sidestep the zero gravity thing and they have a switch where it's like oh suddenly we're in gravity now uh, we've got a gravity engine right and um anything that's um you know i feel is like a horror movie or like a like suspense you know requires a level of like realism or as much realism as you can create just so the audience buys into it you know it's that suspension of disbelief um, so we knew immediately that we wanted to take a stab at, at the zero gravity thing. And that was, that was really tricky because we shot over two days and um, wow. the first day we didn't have um, any wire rigs, but on the second day we had the actor, you know, in a full harness with right. wires sort of coming out the back and all rigged to the ceiling. Mm -hmm. So they were able to be sort of puppeteered and floated and, and all of that. And then in post-production, you remove those uh, things. Um, but the first day, he had to do everything, you know, leaning on a stool or, <laughs> you know. Because it was all shot chest up or, or you know, you're, you're shot close in, right? So he's kind of pretending. Exactly. <laughs> okay, okay, got it, got exactly. it. Exactly. <laughs> That's it. So I think that was, you know, on set, that was tricky. But then you also, when we got into the... Um, the post-production of it. So once we'd filmed the, the two days and we'd edited it all together, um, was adding all of the 3D assets that he lets go of. So he lets go of his- The camera, SLR yeah. And, yeah, he let, you know, he has the, the handset when he's talking uh, or he, when he's listening to suit such transmissions, we had the little cable floating. Um, and then when he lets go of his headset, um, that floats as well. So. I think that was the, the, the most ambitious part of it was, oh my gosh, can we pull this off, you know, realistically enough to draw audiences in? And I think we, I think we managed to do it. I think you definitely did. And I actually, when you were mentioning the wire harness, that reminded me of the scene where you're behind the actor looking through the cupola and there's kind of a rotation. I don't know if it was a camera rotation or, or how you did that, but yeah, it's, it's very atmospheric. And I mean, space can be scary if you put it in the right context for, for a video or a movie. Sure. And this is a prime example of it. There's a lot of suspense, right? Leading up to all the things that happen, which we won't spoil. It's six minutes. Go watch it, everybody. Uh, there's shots that you have of suit set as it's in space. Is that uh, like old video that you repurposed? Is this something that was rendered in the Unreal Engine? How did you do that? Yeah, so the, when the film starts, there's a couple of um, archival shots, yeah. which you probably recognized, and yeah. they were licensed. Um, but then there was... Yeah, pretty much any other time you saw Suitsat was in the in the game engine. So it was a 3D model of a um, 
of an all on space suit and our post-production team cutting edge they you know put their little box and the antenna on yeah. and did did the best best that they could to to replicate um what you guys at aris had sort of put together it looked fantastic i, I think you did a great job and particularly my next follow-on question with that but you've answered it because it's it's done in engine was there's a scene where it it moves and i was like oh okay when did we stop using the 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 footage um and then actually went to something that was rendered in an engine but that's great i mean you i i couldn't tell i thought it was literally an old uh suit the old suit flying by obviously i knew it wasn't captured the way it was but it, it looked fantastic so so great nicely done Look, there was, or, or, or I'm lying and I just have an all on space suit. In my yeah, 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 yeah. You just, <laughs> yeah, you did a great job covering that. Yeah. I don't know how you got it. That, maybe that's a question for another interview. There is <laughs> a shot. The Russians. Yeah. Or yeah, they're coming for you now, I guess. So they're going to come ask you. <laughs> there's a shot that you do. Actually, there's a couple of shots where you've got radio in the background and it's, it's it's meant to sound like the type of contacts were likely going on on Suitsat. Were those recorded from Suitsat, like the actual contacts? No. Um, all I could find on the internet was a young girl saying, "This is Suitsat One RS Zero RS," and then it yeah. went to. Um, I can't recall what language it was, but it was like a man, you know, speaking, you know, it wasn't French. It might, might have been like Hindi or something. I, I don't know what language it was, but it, but it was such a short amount of, and I just was like, okay, look, it's obviously, you know, you have a setup and then you have different voices speaking in different languages. And so basically what we ended up doing and, and Frank, I'd, I'd actually be very curious to know what really were, were being said on, on those um, transmissions. But we sort of had to, um, yeah, take some license and imagine what might be said. Uh, um, and we used a, a great service um, called Fiverr, which is basically like yeah. a freelance platform where people can, you know, say, hey, I'm a voiceover artist and pay me this amount of money. And... So yeah, we just went all over the world getting voices from different languages, different ages, um, Smart. and then just uh, our um, sound designer Tom Keller. He had a lot of fun making those sounds, you know, sound um, like they're coming over the radio. Stuff. Yeah, it it, it was yeah. very the the voices. I think were some of the most off putting parts about it. It's what builds the kind of suspense of what's yeah. going to happen. It was it was it nicely was, done. It was, it, yeah, it was a great. Um, I think you know. I was so overwhelmed or not overwhelmed, but kind of like focused on the visuals and making sure everything we were doing with the set and the projection and, and all of that were, and, and I should also say, you know, on what you see in the film inside the cupola, when you're seeing space, that was all on set. That was a projected image. Um, wow. Which was, which was amazing. Uh, so yeah, the actors got to see that on set. Um, but so while I was, you know, very focused on that sort of thing, I really didn't think of how strong the potential for sound was and those suits at transmissions. And once we'd gotten <laughs> into that process, I was like, oh, wow, this is this has the potential to steal the visuals, you know, the, uh, the spotlight from the visuals. Sure. Well, uh, so projected, it's literally like a, a projector onto a wall and the, the actors are in front yes. of it. So I think the best way to just, it's rear projection. So what you do oh, is. I understand. Yeah. 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 So you have a, like a giant projection wall and you project from the back, uh, which basically means you can have your actor or your set piece as close to, um, as close to the, the, the screen as, well, you, you can have your projector sort of a good distance away and you don't get any spill or anything like that. Right. Um, yeah, That's where they did the Mandalorian, right? Well, actually, they used um, LED screens, so they yeah, used like right. little all all together. We couldn't afford that. Yeah, <laughs> we had to go the, the old school way. That's pretty cool. We were, though. Doing the, the, we were doing the poor man's version of that. Yeah, but it looks amazing. Absolutely amazing. Oh, thank you. 
What was uh, what was it like working? You said you licensed some of the stock footage. Was that something you worked out with NASA, or or what? Did you have to work with NASA or in any of the so agencies? We t- we talked with NASA, and um, the conversation was, you know, look, as long as you don't show our logo, you can, you know, use these things. And but they, the suits that footage wasn't actually in their their library, um, which was strange. I mean, their public library. Um, so we actually had to get it from, I think it was AP. I think we had to get it from uh, the Associated Press, their okay. stock video, mm-hmm. and license it from them. So I don't know how, how that works. That they, could, they must have some deal with NASA or something to, for very specific stock footage that they, they do sort of license out. But, yeah, that's how we went about that. Sure. That, that's pretty interesting. Surprisingly, they didn't have the content. The, the 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 stock footage for it the NASA they had some, yeah they had some photographs I think um, but but not the uh, that great sort of footage that was taken as they pu- pushed it out mm-hmm. wow so Frank the suitsat had a radio in it was it a like a cross band radio that was basically like a, a repeater much like we do with the the FM sats. No, no. Actually, it was Kenwood Radio. It was mm-hmm. a handheld. Okay. It was on one frequency. Um, oh, we okay. Had, like I said, we had three weeks to pull this all together. Uh, Josh, you got an email or a Twitter message, I think, from uh, Steve Bible. Mm-hmm. He was uh, working the digital part of this. Uh, we have had team members around the United States who were doing, you know, the development of the modules that are embedded in the suit and then on top of the suit. And then uh, Sergey Sombarov had one of our antennas we built uh, many years ago, and he used that for the, uh, for, the, for the antenna on top of the suit. So that's basically how that worked. So it's one and frequency, know. and you talk through it to others, a simplex, or how did no, that no, work? No, no, no. It was all, it was all um, transmit down. Oh, it's a beacon, basically. It was all, it was, all, it was uh, basically digital it was slow scan television and it was audio voice um, oh okay this, if you want to hear the story about the audio voice I please can talk about that so um our intent was to have greetings from students all over the world okay and so we did that we had you know different ones and then the, the russians had some greetings too um and i i sent you all a chart package and that it's kind of in that mm-hmm. but um but we got all done, and I get a phone call the night before everything had to be shipped out. And it was, hey, we need, we don't have a call sign. We don't have a uh. voice on this thing. I had a, the story is this. I had to wake my daughter up, um, you know, who's in middle school at the time, which she was not too fond of. And we went through a bunch of takes. She did the... This is suits at one RS zero RS. I have the optics too. <laughs> That's awesome. And, and 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 we put that in there because we had no other choice. We had to get something in, um, and so it ended up being my daughter. And um, so <laughs> when your 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 uh, video came out, I said, Michelle, I don't think it's you. It doesn't sound like you. And she listened to it. And says, Nope, it's not me. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty interesting. <laughs> yeah. What did she think of the film? Oh, she loved it. Absolutely. <laughs> I actually had my wife watch it. I, I had seen it, you know, when we started talking, and uh, I showed her just recently, and, and I didn't, you know, I didn't give her any warning. I'm like, oh, this is about Suitsat. Oh, it's a ham radio thing. And she's like, oh, not another one of these ham radio videos. But I, I put it in front of her, and she's watching it, she's kind of looking at me like, why is it getting scary? <laughs> <What>? <laughs> so it was really fun because it, it's kind of a... It's kind of different from a lot of the stuff I normally make her watch, and so she she thought it was it was quite good. I I, I found that very funny. So yeah, was it Frank? Was it just the audio files that were played out, and then you know break every once in a while so people could hear you know like you said the, the different hellos uh, from around the world kind of thing? And you said yeah. SSTV too, right? Yeah, we had an SSTV image also. Uh, it was about all we could do at the time. Um, the um, messages also the student messages had a. I'll call it a secret word, and the students were supposed to uh, capture that. So we tried to make this, you know, uh, Josh, you, Josh Nash, you Nash, you understand, you know, what a- amateur radio is, and I guess Josh T 
10 or you are starting to learn it now. We're trying to, we, our intent in ERIS is to get students excited about science, technology, engineering, and math through, you know, amateur radio. And so we wanted to use this as another way to capture the world's imagination of, um, of space and of amateur radio. And, and it was clear when we did it, you know, that we, that we were successful because the worldwide attention to this thing, I mean, we had like, and this is in 2006, we had almost 10 million hits to our suitsat.org website uh, in, you know, in, the, in the time frame we did this thing which was only, you know, two weeks. And so That's amazing. Wow. it really was, uh, especially 15 years ago now, actually this past week was the 15th anniversary of the deployment of suits at. Huh. That's pretty awesome. Yeah, it, it's the SSTV contacts, the events that come up, uh, they're always a lot of fun. People get really excited and yeah. imagine if they know that it's coming down from an astronaut suit or cosmonaut suit. I, I bet they would find that pretty interesting. So I guess that's the ten thousand dollar question, right? Every ham always, you know, when they when they find somebody that that doesn't have their license yet, they always got to ask, "When are you going to get your license?" So Josh, it sounds like you're you're looking into ham radio a little bit. I I did a little bit of research, and and I'm look, I, I've dipped my toe in enough to. Uh, to keep going, so I, I would love to explore more for sure. Oh, that's that's good to hear. I know, I think, maybe I'm wrong, I, I don't know that we have many directors that uh, are a part of the community that make, you know, this quality of video. I, I love making video, but I'm very amateur at my level. But what you've done with decommissioned is, is very high level, and I know hams all over the world would love to see more ham radio level of video that you've made here with decommissioned oh thank you yeah it's um you know i've been making films and tv commercials for about 12 years now and i really you know every short film i try and sort of step up um you know the the quality and and i'm so glad to have found you know um the you know your suit set um you know the whole the whole uh, experience, you know information about it it just blew my mind and i was just like i have to i have to make something with this this is too cool <laughs> where can people go to find more of the videos you've done or where would you point people to, to to find out more about you josh so so the vimeo link to um decommissioned if you sort of go lower in the video you can sort of see the Perception Pictures, which is the username. If you click on there, there'll be, you know, a group of other short films. Um, there's one short film called Wandering Soul, which is a um, similarly supernatural film set during the Vietnam War, um, inspired by some freaky true events. Um, that's all I'll say about that. <laughs> and there's another um, sci-fi film uh, set during the early 1960s. Uh, has to do with space and we don't go into space in that one but it is very space themed um, but yeah there's a there's a few shorts in there that sort of um, really show you know my taste and and style um, yeah so I'd love I'd love your audience to uh, check those out yeah that's they'll definitely put it in the description so everybody can go check them out sounds it sounds great because I, I really did enjoy this video so i'll go back and, and watch the whole list uh frank tell i i think a lot of hams know a bit about eris but you know what's the best way to get people more uh information about what you're doing over with eris yeah the best way is to get to our website eris.org a-r-i-s-s.org um you know we we are doing about uh you know, about two schools a week. And it's amazing students uh, get to talk directly to the astronauts on the International Space Station. The astronauts volunteer their time to do this uh, because they believe in uh, our program. Um, and each one of them has to go through that licensing activity, get their ham radio license to actually use our equipment. So uh, it's, a, it's a fantastic program. I mean, basically that's another thing we did uh, back in 1983 was open open the human space flight program up to the general public through image radio and that was with uh, owen garriott who had the call sign uh, w5 lfl he started talking to 
hands on the ground and students were engaged. Uh, they heard these contacts and it, that's the genesis of how our program began um, 37 years ago. That's so cool. It's fantastic. <laughs> I love it. Um, I was curious whether or not anybody could see SuitSat with a telescope from Earth. So take a look. I sent you all a Dropbox link. Uh, we yeah. got an individual actually with a telescope did see SuitSat, and you can actually see it rotating. You're not seeing the satellite <laughs> itself, but you're seeing the, um, the pixels getting bright and dark as the thing is going ah. along. So uh, it's uh, pretty cool. I would imagine if um, if it was any more than just a pixel, that would be terrifying <laughs> to, <laughs> to, to have, to have, um, have your telescope out and suddenly just see this human body. Well, well, first off, first off, I got to say that, you know, I was I saw 2001 a Space Odyssey when it first came out in 1968. And I saw that happen. And it's like when we talked about doing this, it's like, Oh, we got to do this because of, <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna make a science fiction movie a fact. The other part, and this is a story. I don't. I have not a confirmation of this, but I'm ninety percent sure it's correct. Is that someone in the medical field within the space agencies, and I don't know which one it was, was watching. wasn't totally familiar with what was going to happen, and they watched this suit go out, and they almost had a heart attack. <laughs> <laughs> oh sure that's they're like oh no there's somebody's amazing. out the <laughs> yeah someone, <laughs> someone the hatch. <laughs> <laughs> i love it that's funny yeah. quite curious like what what kind of things were um the messages saying um like the voices um from all around the world can you recall uh, is it in that document that you it sent out or? i can i can i have to resurrect them um uh, I've got my Even daughter it, to get you that yeah. too. Uh, um, my, what we were trying to do was to have students in different languages provide greetings, so uh, um, so that everyone felt you know comfortable you know hearing this suit and knowing that they're part of it. The other part I didn't say this is an important piece. We asked before the flight, we asked around the world for people for students to, if they had artwork, signatures, or um, other things, um, if they wanted to fly them, and remember this is 2006, okay? We put them on a CD and we launched it. And if you look at some of the photographs, you can actually see the CD on the front of the suit. Yeah. Students actually were part of the, uh, of the spacewalk. So we did a student spacewalk with them too. Uh, so, you know, the bottom line is oh, we were trying to engage so students as best we could. And, uh, Paul, um, doing the, the the voices, we asked each one of our regions, you know, that supports Eris, to get a student to do that for us. Mm. It's incredible. Looking at these pictures, though, you do get a kind of eerie feeling with the suit just kind of floating out there. I, I do, particularly that vantage of looking down at Earth, and you have the suit just kind of there, and it's not connected to anything. That's right. It's quite and, and, eerie. And those are really good <laughs> One thing I got to tell you is you nailed it relative to suit set. I mean, I, of course, I saw the video as it was happening, you know, when they deployed. And I actually have that video. Uh, we were able to uh, download that from NASA before, uh, uh, before you know, it disappeared, if you will. And, sure. and then watching it rotate and things like that and then seeing the, the video or I'm sorry, the, uh, the pictures that came from this, uh, this telescope operator that actually did it. You nailed the the whole aspect of how suits that went, except for <laughs> the interesting parts at the end. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, that didn't really happen. Oh, I thought this was based on a true story. <laughs> oh, I don't know. You know. <laughs> <laughs> no, I I really appreciate that. I look, I'm sure there's plenty in there that we we got <laughs> we got wrong, but I mean the the fact that you know you feel like we got some of those aspects really, really well is, um, is amazing. Um, thank you for telling me that. Um, but yeah, it's, um, no, it's, it's, I just, I'm just glad that you, when you guys sort of came up with this, you were aware that it did look a bit spooky. 
it, yeah. yeah. And yeah. That, it wasn't, that it wasn't such a shock to you that some people kind of looked at it and went, that's kind of creepy. Yeah. I mean, no, there's movies just based on that, right? Getting stranded in space is kind of everybody's a exactly. fear that people have that, that they think about. I'd like to thank ARL and AMSAT for their sponsorship over the years, you know, from the very beginning of this program. I mean, it's uh, uh, we couldn't have done it without them, and they continue to be staunch supporters of our program. So I did want to get that in. Absolutely, yeah. Big big thank you to AMSAT for, for everything they do as well. So Thank you guys for so much for reaching out and, and um, making this possible. I honestly couldn't have imagined that the guys that were... <laughs> We're responsible for Suits Hat actually reaching out and and, ha and acknowledging having seen it. I, I can't tell you what a thrill, um, just what a thrill it really was to um, to get that that opportunity for you guys to see it. I and it does make me wonder if if the guys on the space station will ever get to see it. Maybe wait for him to get back to Earth before having him watch it. I think <laughs> that would be quite an experience. As soon as I saw that there was something about Suits Hat and someone talking about this is a cool movie, I'm like, oh, wow. So I jumped right on it, and everyone in our team jumped right on it and really enjoyed oh, it. Oh, that's awesome. Oh, well, thank you so much. Thank you for watching it. Thank you for the kind words, and thank you for the inspiration um, because I, don't, I can't do what I do without you guys sort of coming up with these great, amazing things that – I mean, it not only inspired me to make you know a, a short film, but inspire the world and inspire kids to sort of get into amateur radio and and space. And I mean, it's I mean I've been a space nut since I was was a kid, and um, you know here in Australia and everything I always do it keeps coming back to space. <laughs> I'm just you know obsessed with it. So this was a a real labor of love making this short film and. Um, you know, I maybe would love to turn it into a feature film. So maybe we should keep talking. <laughs> yeah, if you're gonna, you know, let us know. We will, you know, we can provide any kind of uh, information if you need it. Um, one thing I didn't say, Josh, uh, Josh Tanner, and I think Josh, you know this, uh, my team's almost all volunteer. Hmm. We do all of this stuff, we don't get paid for it. So we've been uh, doing this yeah. stuff for 20 plus years now. And um, I will let uh, Sergey Sombarov, uh, my colleague in Russia, we're meeting on Tuesday. I'll let him know. Uh, uh, I'll, I'll express our, your thanks to him on, on this whole idea, too. Very yeah, good. Please do. <laughs> it sounds like Frank knows the, uh, the voice actor you might be able to use if you wanted to do future work, too. So <laughs> they can work that out. Oh, gosh. Um, that, that's a thrill. That's a thrill to hear. Because like, I heard so few... Um, voice bits, uh, you know, of the of the real transmissions, and yeah, your daughter was 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 the one I I did hear. So it's amazing. I didn't, it, you know, my my daughter didn't like the whole idea until about three years later. Then she realized what difference she made to the world, if you will. Is there a recording of that like, somewhere, oh, Frank? You're, wait, you're waking yeah. me up for this. <laughs> I can send it to you. I'll send you the link. This is Suitsat One Amateur Radio Station. RS0RS. Boy, this is a lot of fun, guys. I'm, I'm really glad you're able to hop on here. Uh, this is on the ARRL's YouTube channel. I, I really appreciate the ARRL for letting me do this, but you know, I want to say again, big thanks to Josh, Director of Decommissioned, and Frank Bauer, KA3HDO, the Aris Chairman. I am Josh, KI6NAZ. I run the Ham Radio Crash Course also here on YouTube, and, and we all really appreciate you watching. Thanks so much for doing so. Thank you. Thank you. This is Suitsat 1, amateur radio station, RS0RS. Mission time is 0, 0, 0, 3, 0, 1 minutes. The temperature is 27 degrees Celsius. The battery voltage is 27.4 volts. This is Suitsat 1, amateur radio station, RS0RS. Дорогие мои опции. От имени всех работающих на центральной базе МАИ в Москве и всех его филиалах в Байконуре, Ахтубинске, Жуковском, Люберцах, Таганроге, Серпухове, Химках сердечно поздравляю вас с 75-летием 
Московского авиационного института. Желаю крепкого здоровья, счастья, оптимизма и больших творческих успехов на благо нашей великой Родины. Шлю космический привет всем радиолюбителям планеты Земля. Спасибо. Saludos a todos los estudiantes del mundo. Somos vuestros amigos desde Europa. Nuestra palabra especial es futuro. Grüße zu allen Studenten in der Welt. Wir sind eure Freunde aus Europa. Unser spezielles Wort ist Zukunft. This is Südstadt One, Amateur Radio Station, RS0RS. Земляне, уважаемые граждане России, дорогие баумцы, я обращаюсь к вам в год славного юбилея жемчужины российского и мирового инженерного образования Московского государственного технического университета имени Баумана. 175-летняя история МГТУ имени Баумана – это история развития научной и технической мысли в нашей стране и мире. В объективах нашего спутника Земля показывает себя во всей красе. Она так прекрасна, наша планета. Давайте сохраним наш дом. This is Suitsat 1, amateur radio station, RS0RS. Bonjour à tous les élèves du monde entier. Nous sommes très contents de vous envoyer un message Canada. Nous voulons vous souhaiter la paix, l'amour, l'harmonie et beaucoup de joie. Nous espérons que vous avez aimé cette communication venant de l'Espagne. Le mot spécial du Canada est « ERAP ». This is Suitsat 1, amateur radio station, RS0RS. On the occasion of the university anniversary, my congratulations to the Moscow State Technological University staff, all the Bauman postgraduates, upon the Jubilee Space Youth Satellite is our present to the world radio amateurs, this being one more step in space education program. Alexander Alexandrov, project manager, cosmonaut of Russia. This is Suitsat 1, amateur radio station, RS0RS. This is Suitsat 1, amateur radio station, RS0RS. Greetings to the students around the world. This is a message from your friends at Eastern Middle School in the United States. We share a mutual excitement about the future of space travel. The USA special word is freedom. This is Suitsat 1, amateur radio station, RS0RS. <laughs> Celsius. The battery voltage is 27.4 volts. 